So hey everyone, my name is Camila Sanders and I am your host of Fashion Futurist Brands. And today we have Nisha Blackwell with us all the way from Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. And I'm so happy that you could join me for this first inaugural episode um, on YouTube. And I'm, I'm just excited to uh, to have you here. And we first met, like it was in the middle of the pandemic, right? <laughs> so, so I can't wait to kind of get into your story and, you know, everything that you've done in your business. Um, but first I will allow you to introduce yourself. Um, thank you so much <laughs> for having me on this inaugural <laughs> interview <laughs> and, and podcast. It feels so, so it's an honor. I mean, I've got to watch your journey and it just feels great to be here with oh, you today. Thank um, you. And yeah, from meeting, we met on Clubhouse <laughs> like over a year, <laughs> like a, over a year ago and we connected yes. on some other sustainable things. So just for it to come full circle like this and for you to keep us in your thoughts, just really appreciate it. So I am Nisha Blackwell. I am the founder and CEO of Knott's Land Bowties and Sustainable Accessories. We make all handmade bow ties and accessories out of repurposed and reclaimed fabrics and materials, all made here in the U.S., here in Pittsburgh, hyper-local production um, model that we've built. And I, yeah, I'm not going to say too much because I'm sure some things will come out of the questions because I could go into the whole story. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I'm so excited about it. Um, so yeah, so I, but I would love to know, like, I always want to know, how did you even get into fashion? Like, have you always been into fashion or, you know, like how did, how did that kind of start off? When did you, you know, figure out, oh, I can actually have a career doing this? You know, it's so funny because when I started, I went so full speed ahead in this business idea and this thought of like reclaiming and doing good for the world and for the planet and for the environment and for the people that it took me until probably 2020 pandemic, <sighs> peak pandemic, when we all had to kind of slow down to realize and dig deep into the inspiration behind like why the creative field, why the creative profession. And it goes back to, I've always been extremely creative, always made things, um, always loved working with my hands. And I found some of my sketchbooks from when I was a kid and I was always drawing gowns actually and dresses and clothing. <laughs> I just, we were uh, going through some of our things uh, the other day and I was looking like, wow, I really was into this, this idea of adornment and accessories and drawing just these beautiful, glamorous Met Gala style <laughs> things. I didn't wow. realize that, that would come to shape in a bow tie company. Um, but yeah, that, that creativity flows and runs really deep. And so when I stumbled into entrepreneurship, it just felt right. I finally found my purpose. And I would say that growing up, I had never seen any successful creative professionals. I come from a background where, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. You know, you either had to go to school to be a doctor, a lawyer, a nurse, right. something traditional so that you can make money. But there weren't a lot of, you know, exposures to a lot of different career choices. And so I think that's what took me so long to get into the creative profession. Cool. And so, but um, Knotsland started when, when did, what did Knotsland start? So Knotsland started in 2015. Okay. Yeah. So, so you started doing it in 2015, but I guess in 2020, you're saying like, that's when it kind of like hits you, like, this is it. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Wow. And so in 2020, that was in the middle of the pandemic, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was when COVID oh, first started. And that, a... that's the same year that I met you and I was super impressed by your story because I talk a lot about social impact. And um, one of the first things that I learned about you and your business and what you're doing in Pittsburgh um, was about the um, at-home sewers and how you were helping to, um, you know, get people work and things like that. So can you talk a little bit about kind of that initiative that you did and how you had to pivot during 
um, the pandemic. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, when I decided to take business seriously and to really build a business model, I dug deep into understanding, like, where is my true passion? Like, what are the things that I'm really passionate about? And I've always been an advocate in the community, community meetings, community organizations, volunteering and things. And so I was like, how do I combine my passion for the environment and for the people? And I had actually read the book, The Green Collar Economy, one of my first sustainability wow. books, by yeah. Dan Jones. And he talked about this idea of creating circularity and jobs that do good. And I was like, wow, here's the light bulb. Like I can really do good and have a business. And so um, in the beginning of Nosland, I didn't know how I was going to incorporate that into the business model. But I remember working as a host at a hotel, like a um, hotel restaurant and going home at, in the evenings and working on my business and going back to work and just doing this whole burning the <laughs> candle at both ends. But yeah. I remember being particularly excited to get home to sew. So once I started thinking about the model, I was like, well, what's the thing that I wish existed? And it really was this idea of being able to work from home and have a work from home opportunity. Now that is a, that is everywhere. But back right. then it wasn't as um, mainstream or as, as incorporated as it is into our everyday lives. But it was this idea of like, how do you provide work from home income opportunities for people so that they can still also pursue their creative passions and endeavors. And I learned through having our first studio assistant, um, she was a sewing enthusiast. And I learned that it gave her time to work on projects in Knotsland, get paid, but also while she was sewing, she already had all her materials out. So she was also creating things for her own business and her own like reconstructed t-shirts and things like that. So that's when I started to really understand the power of providing flexible work from home opportunities. And we've just built that model out to being 29 women who have come through our programming and are like ready and willing and excited to sew. That's great. So in, in during the pandemic, you were making masks, right? Yes. So that, so that was like a huge thing. <laughs> It's, it's so wild because that model, when I got the phone calls that like, you know, business had to be shut down, the pandemic was going to affect businesses and all of our weddings got canceled. We had a whole lineup of weddings for, you know, bow ties. I had gone into a really, really sad, disappointed, deflated place because it was my first time as a business owner that I had to call our contacts and say, hey, we don't have like all of our projects were kind of pulled from us and we don't have those projects anymore. And then I started to see, you know, the call for masks and I'm like, oh my gosh, like we, this is something that we've been building up to. Like if we don't participate, we're, we're, we're crazy. <laughs> you know, right. we're, we're not thinking about the impact that we could potentially have in this moment. So that's when I went back and I taught myself how to make masks and figured out which masks we were going to make. And then slowly started incorporating, reincorporating my team back into the business and reincorporating the community to the point where when it was all said and done through organizations, individual purchases, we had infused over $55,000 back into the sewist community during that time. And I was just like, wow. that's when I was able to see the power at full force because it was an uncertain time. People were able to still keep busy and contribute to something meaningful, but also get paid to do so. And I was just like, yeah, this is, this is it. That is, that is so powerful because that's like the power of being an entrepreneur. Like you're able, because you kind of started to establish your business and thought about a business model and, you know, started, you know, progressing that you're able to meet the needs of so many other people and do it in a ethical way. Um, yes. And before, cause I know you talked about how you, um, you know, drew like gowns and adornments and things like that. Why bow ties? <laughs> Every single person asks why bow ties. Because it's so like unique. It's like everyone wants to do clothes and this and that. And then it's like bow ties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, bow ties came from the idea 
of me making something. So before Nosland, there was Little Lady Glambos, <laughs> which was <laughs> a small business that I started to really, I, I made a gift for a friend's daughter. It went really well at the birthday party. That's when I taught myself how to sew. That's when I, you know, learned the the benefit of reusing materials because I had used a, used a bag of thrifted clothing that I already mm-hmm. had. So I didn't go purchase new materials. And in that moment, that's when the light bulb went out like, okay, I mean, went off or on, <laughs> like, okay, people want something that I'm making. Now, the price point that we had to charge in the hair bow market, well, that I had to charge in the hair bow market was a little bit steep. And, you know, I can only extend to my immediate friends and family circle before they were just like, you know, we can find hair bows anywhere. They're beautiful, right. but yeah. we can find hair bows anywhere. <laughs> but then in that same moment, I was starting to get requests for little boys. Like, well, do you make anything for little boys? At that time, unisex clothing you know, more gender neutral clothing was not a thing. This was still 2015, which it feels close, but it was before the movement around creating and being thoughtful. So there were still trucks and dinosaurs and (laughs) dolls and stars and rainbows, right? And it was separate. And so these parents were saying, I would love to like dress my little boy up in something expressive. And that's when we went from hair bows to bow ties. Oh, a ton of research and development. I was like, well, if we're going to go from a hair bow to a bow tie, we need to do this in a thoughtful way so that it doesn't appear, you know, if you think of the reasoning behind the parents wanting to to choose a, a bow tie, it is to distinguish from that, you know, glittery, more femme presenting clothing to a hair bow to a structured, more menswear, more, you know, neutral accessory. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I did tons of research and development. I pitched to get into a startup um, accelerator and incubator space. And that's where we got our first round of seed funding. And in that moment, that's when it felt like our idea was validated. um, Our mentorship was there. And we just like went with it and kept going and kept taking the business extremely serious. And it there's been <laughs> bumps in the road, but that's where the bow tie was born. Okay. So at that time, did you, how many people were in your business? Like, did you have a partner or was no, it, just it was you or like, it was okay. just me. And then I had a production, I had soon after hired a production assistant and she would come to my home. Back then it was like my grandfather's old home. It was like raggedy old house, but I was living rent free and I was building this business and she came and we would be cutting in very small spaces. My living room was like packed with fabrics. It was no longer a living room. (laughs) And so that's when she, you know, she also as a production assistant, she did production assistant part-time and then would do the sewing from home, like any other materials that needed done. So she helped us really build the framework of the Sew From Home program and ended up being our lead trainer to, to um, teach everyone and do the trainings. Wow. And she is still with us today. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love, so let's talk about um, like sustainability and ethics, right? Because we always yeah. talk about um, in this space, like where do your clothes from? Who, come from, where do your clothes come from and like, who's making your clothes and to think that you have this business that you are providing income to people in a ethical way and in a way that fits with their, um, lifestyle. And then also sustainably, uh, with the materials that are, they're upcycled, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where do you source your materials from? Yeah. Wow. You know, when we first started, (laughs) it started from a bag of thrifted clothing that I was going to rework and I never got to. Right. And that's where like the hair bows and some of the first bow ties came from. And then I started going to this reuse center. It's kind of like a fab scrap, but here Uh in Pittsburgh and started getting fabrics from there and whatever I could get, I would remake into bow ties. And one of the main things that I noticed, there were a lot of like design samples 
from furniture companies and upholstery companies and and different um, larger manufacturing places. But these things were like at constant in like they came in that place constantly because the the seasons change and they're very seasonal and there's not a lot of things that many people can do with these small squares of fabric. So Mm -hmm. that's where we started to like, we're like, okay, well, we don't want to just only take the bolts of fabric here at this reuse place, but we want to get down to like the things that are most likely to be hard or unusable. So that was really the, the basis of it is challenging ourselves to use materials that are traditionally not used in garments and and fashion. And so from there, we have just organically, mostly, I I would say intentionally, but we've pretty much organically attracted larger sourcing partners. So then you would have a drapery company or you would have an interior designer come to us and say, hey, I heard that you use these samples. Come come into my office because we're trying to get rid of some or I am closing my studio and we have tons of fabric. Please come and get it. I remember wow. the very first source of like big fabric samples came from a reupholstering shop here in Pittsburgh. Uh, my mentor in the startup accelerator said, I understand that you want to use reclaimed materials, but you're going to have to find consistent sources for those reclaimed materials. So I go into Google and the first shop that popped up was this upholstery shop about, you know, six miles from where I am. I call this lady. I tell, I'm like, Hey, I reuse, you know, samples and fabric samples. Before I could even get that out, she was like, come down here right now and get these things. There's a bag sitting in front of me that was just about to go into the trash. And I was like, okay. So I call my little brother and we go down there and we load in these beautiful and like, let's not forget to mention how beautiful interior fabrics are. And, you know, we also go into the influence of interiors and fashion too. Like, man, we just felt like we hit a gold mine at that day, in that day. And that again, just made me realize that there is so much more. And from there came the interior designers. We work with a a, um, furniture company in Jersey and they send us huge rolls of overstock. We work with some bridal shops that send us alterations. And so it's just the possibilities around reuse and upcycling and reclaiming are just endless. It just takes imagination that that imagination and sourcing is once you get into the, the, the ecosystem there will be too much fabric like we're constantly like okay we need to get down to like what fabrics can we actually use <laughs> what do we need in this moment like maybe we don't need more samples maybe we need more you know wedding and bridal fabrics maybe we call up one of our sourcing partners so we've started to like shift and um, sort our our sourcing partners out depending on need. And so now we have that relationship and everything that comes into Nosland is weighed and it's measured and it's tracked because that data for us and also for our customers and that transparency is important. So we do all of those things. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, the cool thing about it is that if you get a bow tie from Nosland, you probably, it's probably something that you can't get anywhere else, right? (laughs) No, not at all. (laughs) Do you have any like examples or or samples? Oh, yes, absolutely. (laughs) If you happen to have any near you, I know you're in your shop. Tons of tons of examples around here. I'm just going to pull a couple fun ones here. So here... We have um, our double layer bow tie and it's fabric that was given to us by the pattern was given to us by a lady whose son did a lot of travels in South Africa and he had a ton of um, just a collection of fabrics that he gave her and she (laughs) gifted them to us because she was like, I just want them to go to good use. And we get a lot of quilters and quilters children who do that as well. 
um, the back of this here is, um, I don't know if you can see that, but there was a company here in Pittsburgh that remade fabrics using, um, they used plastic bottles from Haiti. So, you know, the, the people in Haiti would gather the bottles and collect them and be paid for them. And mm -hmm. these bottles would then come and be broken down into small fibers and then created into yarn to make the fabric. And so that's why it's like that green, it's like a weird soda green <laughs> fabric and yeah. we, we have fun with it. And it, that is beautiful. It, Thank it's you. so cool. And it's so cool that it has like the whole story behind it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because someone told me a couple, like a while ago, like, you know, a Nodslander when you're in the space with them, because they will tell you the entire story of their bow tie, whether you want to know or not, they'll tell you the story of the fabrics, the story of how it's made, the story of how it's a black owned company. And those are the types of advocates that we want to have in the world. And so even when you think about just like people are like, you know, you said, why bow ties? This little thing, when you look at it, most people are not like attracted to the fact that it's a sustainable, you know, sustainable product, right? So it's stylish mm -hmm. and it's style centric. So everyone who is <laughs> interested in a bow tie, it doesn't say like, oh, you have to be interested in sustainability. So right. when people are attracted to our bow ties, they're attracted to the style first. And then they get these layers and layers upon story that then allow them to become advocates in the community for sustainable fashion and for ethical fashion and sustainability. So that's one of my like favorite parts of not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's kind of like, um, you know, like how do you, how do you get the word out right about your products, but like everyone that wears them is like, you know, you know, screaming from the top of the roof, like, this is what I got. And, you know, and I always tell people like the biggest, the biggest way to communicate, like you wanting to be sustainable and wanting other people to be sustainable is just like, talk about what you're wearing and talk about why you're wearing it and what the story is behind it and where you got it from. And I think that is, is really encouraging. And I also like now I'm like, I know you can order them online, but now I'm like, I really would like love to go to the store and like hear this story about all the different ones. So like, can you, can you talk a little bit about um, like your brick and mortar store? Because, you know, there's a lot of like direct to consumer and a lot of people are selling clothes online and kind of, that's kind of almost a little scary to do it, to actually have a brick and mortar, especially nowadays. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about about that, like the decision to have a brick and mortar, or did you always have one? Or so we started out with a small studio space, um, and we recognized this this sort of trend in folks who we made more sales when we were at pop ups, and people could experience our brand. Um, now they may not have purchased it right then and there, but it redirected them to our e-commerce site. So mm -hmm. our choice to open a e-commerce, a uh, brick and mortar really came from this idea of a growing understanding that fashion is, is very like tactile. It's very yes. experiential, you know, clothing and shopping is still very experiential. And even if we're able to have someone encounter our product one good time and they can become an advocate and, and speak for the quality and share that with a, another person who they know loves bow ties, you know? And so that's really the decision of opening a brick and mortar and also creating an experience. Um, it's one thing to be online and experience our products. We hear it all the time that like they're beautiful online, but when you see them in person and you feel the quality, it's just like unmatched. And yeah, I can imagine with all the places that you source from, like, it's, yeah. it's like, it's, it's so, it's so wild to, to think about, you know, and there's just also just economical reasons 
for us to market online and stand out online, you know, as a small sustainable brand, we just didn't have that bandwidth. So we more so felt that it would be more impactful to have an experience where people can come in and, and feel, and we can attract even people who come to town to get a bow tie before they leave and those mm-hmm. sorts of things to have more of an organic approach to marketing. Um, until we're able to like <laughs> get a budget that's high enough to like <laughs> ban <laughs> millions of dollars exactly. that, that, uh, exactly. that companies use to, to market to consumers. But I, but I do think like nowadays it's really is about, I mean, it's always been about marketing. It's about word of mouth. Right. Mm-hmm. And so if you can, if you can build those, those customers that are really advocates and are mm-hmm. telling your story then that's how things spread. And it's very organic and it's very authentic and transparent. And that's just how things work now. Yeah. Um, and so can you talk about, because I know that you've had some celebrities where, where your bow ties, because I have been following your journey too. And I'm like, just, just over here, just clapping every day. And when I, when I, see some of your posts. Can you talk about some of those things that have happened along your journey? Wow. I mean, just again, it took for, I'm a person who just dives in and gets to work and barely comes up for air. And that was the first like five years of Nosland. And then the pandemic hit and it really put into perspective the accomplishments that we had and even such an early stage in the brand. You know, we got a film made by Google, which if you go on our website in the About Us section, you'll see this like production that we could not ever afford, but it tells our story and it tells our origin story um, really well. And then we became part of Facebook Small Business Council, where we start to we were actually flown out there to give some insights on different small business marketing and, you know, really create community around that. And just all of these little, these not little, big moments that really I hadn't had a chance to process. And from there, we've just started to attract, um, we, it started the, the whole Celebrity thing started with a local football player, surprisingly. His name okay. is Ryan Shazier, and he's an advocate for, um, I think he may have alopecia and had some um, some struggles during his seasons and just has become a huge champion in the community. And people come to us and just like, I want the one that he's wearing. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> okay, <laughs> we can make something similar. And then we started getting different um, wrestlers and different individuals who just, you know, want a cool, unique, one of a kind bow tie. And most notably, most recently, (laughs) we finally officially got to the Oscars, (laughs) which was like a a big deal for us. Um, Danny Glover wore a Knott's Land bow tie to accept his Gene Herschel humanitarian uh, Oscar this year. Wow. And people ask us all the time, like, how did you get that opportunity? So I'm going to, (laughs) I'm going to share that. (laughs) And really what happened is um, someone from his team reached out. It's so serendipitous. And this is how you know that like, what is for you is for you. When you're doing the right things, when you're, you know, out here and, and being a champion for your brand, what, is for you will come to you and you don't have to worry about, you know, the next person getting things because your things will come to you as well. And this was just, you know, I had just went on a mini vacation with my fiance. We were supposed to be logged out of everything. And as soon as we put our bags on the bed, I get an Instagram message saying, Hey, um, please reach out, please contact me. I'm interested in getting a bow tie for Gl- Danny Glover for the Oscars. Now, immediately it, it's like, is this a joke? Is this spam? Like, but there was right. a phone number there. <laughs> there was a phone number there. And I asked my fiance, I'm like, do you mind if I like, he's like, yeah, of course, go ahead. Cause you know, it's supposed to be our time. And I'm like, okay. 
And I called back and the lady answered and she told me the story about how he had gotten a custom jacket and it didn't work out. And so they just decided to focus on the accessory, but they wanted the accessory to be meaningful and to showcase even his commitment to the labor and, and you know, the labor movement along the years and all of his humanitarian work humanitarian work and so it wow. was they researched black owned businesses and we came up which felt like <laughs> wild i'm like well we're doing something right with seo because <laughs> yeah, I, know. I was like google it <laughs> seo yes okay that's right <laughs> so and you know a lot of people would have thought oh they found you on instagram they actually googled you know mm-hmm. black owned bow tie companies and I guess, custom bow tie companies. And we created a collection of four pieces that were really stressful to make. I was like on, (laughs) I got no sleep that week because I was just like, we need to make these perfect. They need to be like the perfect size, the perfect shape. They need to be like packaged really beautifully and shipped to Uh LA (laughs) to this hotel. And everything worked out and they were really, really excited about the ties. And it's, definitely one of the top, top, top moments of the past seven years of Knott's Land for sure. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations (laughs) on that. That is super exciting. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And so um, what'd you say? I said, thank you for asking. Cause I just like, (laughs) every time I share it, I'm like, wow, that was like wild. Like did that actually happen? (laughs) That happened. (laughs) So, so are there any other like pivotal moments in your business or um, any, any, any moments that maybe might shine a light or resources for other people or other brands that are looking to be uh, sustainable and ethical on their journey? So... You know, one of the first pivotal moments was the opportunity to get some funding, which really felt validating and said, you know, this is a thing. So I would say to any aspiring sustainable fashion designer to keep going, keep putting in applications. And that first bit of funding will give you so much, you know, it's not even so much about the money. Like, yes, we definitely need money. We need the money all the time as small business owners. But it's more so like, wow, someone has invested in me. So now I have to like shift into gears. And so that was really instrumental. And then just the moments along the way, like having a community of women who, you know, are moms and students and, and, and retired women who are all passionate and connected to the brand beyond just, you know, be just sewing from home. Right. Like that's one small part of their participation. They are also advocates. They are also creatives. They are also, you know, the the backbone of Knott's Land and what keeps us going. And so those are, that's another big moment when I discovered just the power of that community. So again, mm-hmm. build your communities, even if it isn't a work from home community, it could be, you know, sewing groups and just people that you can lean on and feel supported by especially early on and throughout the journey. Um, Yeah, those are just the really the main things and just believing that you have to believe relentlessly in your idea and your business because it will be just as high as the valleys go. (laughs) I mean, just as high as the peaks go, the valleys go (laughs) deep as well (laughs) they go pretty low and pretty deep (laughs) and that passion and those high moments and enjoying those high moments and and really you know reflecting on the big and the small and appreciating the whole entire journey along the way is where I would say you know that would be advice even the beginning like I wish I could go back to the beginning of Nosland and just not to say that I would do anything different there's definitely things I would do different but more so just to experience that like you know that gritty like <laughs> energeticness we've gotten into a routine which feels nice you know we've built our structure and our foundation but just that like everyone pitching in and it just being like scrappy 
his was it was it was a moment so oh, every, yeah. That's... <laughs> every stage is important <laughs> Exactly. You like kind of look back on it, those first stages and you're like, wow, look how far we've become, you know? Yes. So, yes. Yeah. That's, uh, that's always, that's always fun. Um, so where can people find you on social or even to visit in person? So people can find us in um, Pittsburgh, PA. We, if you search Knoxland, our storefront address will come up anytime you're here. We're also in quite a few shops around the city and outside of the city, but you can also find that information at Knoxland.com, which is our e-commerce site. Um, it has information on how we started, information on our impact, and and um, our sustainability reports are also on there. And wow. yeah, you can also shop the brand on there. Wow. Um, that's <laughs> great. And I will definitely have to look you up when I'm like somewhat near the area. <laughs> so I yes. can visit because I really want to come in. Yes. Um, yeah. So that's great. I mean, thanks so much for joining me. And I loved hearing your story um, and about what you're doing in the sustainability space. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts. I know you're um, everyone's just kind of a a big and a small piece of the whole puzzle of what we're doing in sustainable ethical fashion. Um, I don't I don't know if you had any thoughts or um, or ideals on the industry as a whole as to some of the things that we should be doing just in this industry um, to kind of move the mark toward more sustainable ethical practices. Yeah. So. I definitely have a lot of thoughts on that. One of my, <laughs> one of my like the 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 bright lights in this whole thing is um, being a part of the remake community and seeing the the movement and the power that mm -hmm. that community has and supporting um, their endeavors and you know the policy and the pushes for different. Um, ethical and fair practices in different manufacturing spaces and and just companies in general also the 15 percent pledge i think that's what it's called where they're yeah. really um, amplifying the voices of black and brown creatives and so i just think that the the industry as a whole you know we often just create like a lot of silos but figuring out a way for the industry as a whole to really you know, fellowship and collaborate and communicate and, and build those different um, sort of just like that the, the pockets of people that can yeah. create like meaningful change and just more investment in sustainable. Like we're still pretty behind when it comes to like understanding circular economies and mm -hmm. sustainable fashion and how to truly support um the idea of like a triple bottom line and not having like all financial returns, but having you right. know qualitative as well as quantitative returns and just like more advocacy and, and language and policy being built around supporting um, brands that are really trying to do this um, ethically and fairly because it's, you know, it's like already expensive to get things made in the U.S., but from right. a sustainable fashion standpoint, it becomes even more like almost inaccessible. So it, it, I think there's going to be more advocacy needed around supporting these small brands who have impact to scale and grow. That's, that, that's, that's great. A lot of like, I'm like, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but how do I like... <laughs> Concise it into one answer. We could have we could talk for an hour about this whole thing. Um, but I love I love how you how you're talking about like supporting smaller brands that are actually sustainable and ethical because a lot of what you hear is like these larger brands and everyone knows that they're you know greenwashing and saying they're sustainable but they're really not and it's kind of like you know how do we shape policy around supporting larger brands that are doing great things in the community like you are and are actually, you know, um, you know, being sustainable and using scraps and things like that. And mm -hmm. you also brought it back to community, which you talked about before. It's kind of like, how do we, 
how do we band together as groups to make things happen? Like you mentioned Remake and, and just partnering with other people and, and coming together as a community to, to mm-hmm. advance. So I love that. <laughs> Absolutely. And you keep doing your great work because you have just been committed and consistent and I appreciate you in the space so much. Thank you so And I love much. your sewing machine and your sewing machine. Uh, I'm yeah. wanting to say something yeah. about that. that is- <laughs> this, is, this is actually my mom's like old, old sewing machine. So I'm like, yes, please give it to me. I use it as decoration, but I have another one that, that I actually use. But this one is, is, is kind of, you know, meaningful because it's my mom's old, old machine. So, yeah. It's beautiful. And she's a showpiece. Just let her be retired and just be beautiful. (laughs) Exactly. Thank you so much. Um, I hope I can get to Pittsburgh soon and maybe take some photos and we can talk about the bow ties and I can learn all about them. Um, But yeah, thanks so much. I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Likewise, you have a wonderful rest of your day and week. You too.